You ready to start, Nick? <clears throat> yeah, you think uh, I think most people are here? I imagine there will be some folks trickling in. My experience with technology is it always takes a couple minutes for everybody to find their way into a meeting like this. Yeah. Yeah, because I know this is a, a Teams meeting and not a Zoom meeting that typically people are more used yeah. to. Yeah, for sure. Some people are more familiar with different technologies too. Sure. Yep, yep. Oh, let's see here. Well, <laughs> folks, I apologize. I'm clearing my throat in the, in the microphone. Um, this is Brian Isaacson. I'm Public Works Director for Ramsey County. We have a team here to talk about the Cleveland Avenue project. I just wanted to say um, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. And I think Commissioner Mattis Castillo had intended to be here to make some introductory comments. Unfortunately, she's for all of you who've ever been in a school athletic event. It has run long and she's she's going to try to get here before we're done, but she's not able to be here when we start. So uh, I think I think uh, Ethan Austin is on and he can maybe convey some thoughts from the commissioner and then we can start with our presentation if that's OK. Is the technology working for everybody? Everybody able to hear? Awesome, thanks, Pat. Ethan, if you're on, please jump in. Yeah, hi everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. My name's Ethan Oston. I'm a uh, principal assistant to Commissioner Mattis Castillo at the Ramsey County Board. Um, you know, she has only represented uh, the full part of Cleveland since, uh, well, two weeks now, but uh, before this, in the previous term, she represented the east side of Cleveland, and so we've been uh, involved in this project for a while. Um, I just wanted to express on her behalf uh, her appreciation for the level of engagement that has happened in this project, both from the community and from staff. Um, we know that this has been a really difficult project in a lot of ways, with a lot of competing interests and a lot of um, strong emotions, but we're really grateful for the partnerships with the community and the collaborations that we've had with various groups of community members who are trying to make this into a better and, you know, more St. Anthony Park project. And so um, we're excited for this meeting tonight and for the opportunity to really achieve both our climate and environmental preservation goals at the same time as delivering a project that will be part of our all ability transportation network and is something that we hope the neighborhood can really enjoy for generations to come. So um, really glad that you're all here tonight and um, I'll turn it over to Public Works. Thank you, Ethan. We appreciate it. All right, Brian, can you see my first slide? I can. All right. All right, I can I can start off if you're ready. I'm ready to go. All right. Uh, thanks again, Brian and Ethan. Uh, I'm Nick Fisher with Ramsey County. I am the project manager for the Cleveland Avenue Reconstruct. Um, we're reconstructing Cleveland Avenue from Como to Larpeter. And as you can see in this picture here, the, the road is pretty much at the end of its useful life and had to be reconstructed. So we're going to kind of talk about process, how we got to where we are today. Uh, so first off, um, this is a Teams meeting. Um, most people probably are more used to uh, um, Zoom, so this is a little training on how teams work. Uh, presentation etiquette, so please mute when you're not speaking. And then uh, if you could turn off your camera when you're not speaking, that would help with uh, people's bandwidth if they have you know low internet problems. Um, keep that off, that would be helpful. Uh, question section will be at the end, so please ask questions at the end. However, we do have a chat. Uh, going that our our construction engineer Luke Lordy was uh, gracious enough to help me out with. Um, use the raise hand function at the end of the meeting and we can get to your questions. And this meeting is being recorded so we can uh, put it on our website later. So teams logistics. So all the icons at the bottom of your screen are really what you need to know. Uh, there's a little chat button there. Uh, the reactions has your raise hand feature in there. Uh, the camera on or off, click on that, and then most importantly, the mic on or off. And again, if at the end you don't want to uh, speak, you can always put a question in the chat and, and we can get to that as well. So why are we here? What are we doing? Uh, what's this project? Um, so the main goal of this project is help 
you know, pedestrians and students uh, to get across the street and along the street and anywhere they need to go. Uh, this also includes uh, bicyclists. There's a lot of bikes at the U and we need to plan for them in our road design. And also last but not least is is the, the roadway itself. Uh, we want to improve the roadway surface. There's a particular pothole at Buford right now that I would love to fix, and we'll definitely get to uh, fixing that permanently next year. So there's a road surface is definitely crumbling and needs to be redone with this project. So why else are we here? What else are the goals? Uh, the University of Minnesota, believe it or not, is pretty much the main property owner on the east side of the project. Uh, so they're very much a project partner. They were great to work with during this project, but a lot of our our goals were around getting students to and from class and, and how do we do that the most, uh, the best way and the safest way for them. Uh, so a little stats about the U of M uh, St. Paul campus. They have 9,000 students, which is way more than I was expecting, uh, 2,100 staff, and there's also 2,000 living in U of M housing on the St. Paul campus. So that's just not students, that's also students with families. So there could be little kids out here uh, running around and we need to plan for them as well. Uh, so one of the first goals of this project is to uh, make it more bike friendly. Here's a picture of a bike rack outside the student center. Um, this is a student center. We're gonna have a, a in-house uh, public meeting in about two weeks there. This is uh, right next to Buford and Larpenter, um, or sorry, Buford and and Cleveland. So that stoplight you kind of see at the far end of your picture um, is that intersection. So there's a lot of bicyclists on the university campus and we need to definitely plan for them in our design. So let's talk about bike lanes. So one of the goals of this project was to put bike lanes on Cleveland. Um, so I guess, why is that? Um, currently there's bike lanes on Larpenter, and Gortner and Commonwealth and Como and Raymond. And there's kind of an obvious hole, north-south hole in here of, of Cleveland Avenue. Why, why isn't there any bike lanes there? And it would be great to have them there. Um, so students, like I said, there's 9,000 students here and they're everywhere and a lot of them are biking. So it'd be nice to have a bike facility that they could use uh, to get to where they're going, either going home or going to class or, or whatever they're doing. Um, so one of the, the main goals was to put a bike lane on Cleveland and a lot of the comments are like, well, why can't we just have them use Gortner? It's, you know, just right there. Why don't they use that? And the issue with that is um, bike lanes really need to connect to each other. If there's just a one mile orphan of bike lane, it really doesn't do any good. It needs to connect to other bike facilities just like roads do so you can get from place to place. And also this, there's students everywhere, so there should be bike facilities everywhere, especially on a, a university campus. So in 2022, so this year, uh, we did some construction out there, uh, we made a lot of dust and noise, so what did we do? Um, we put in some water main between Como and Buford because that was kind of our limits for the year. Uh, we also put in storm sewer and a trail on the U of M side. So there was, a, there was kind of a lot of work going on out there to this year, but uh, but also some things we didn't finish uh, up before the uh, the winter caught us, and uh, this is what we got left to do. There's a sidewalk on the west side that didn't get put in, uh, mostly because there is a supply chain issue with concrete. There just wasn't enough concrete in the state of Minnesota to get everyone's sidewalk in everywhere. So they kind of prioritized the concrete industry curb and gutter to get streets built and said, oh, we'll get sidewalk next year. And I'm sure you will hear a lot of comments at the end of this about the missing sidewalk. And, that, and that's um, really tough on the neighborhood. And I know, and we would love to put that in. We'll put that in next year. Unfortunately, it was just a crazy time to be building things where you're running out of concrete. Um, last layer of paving and stripes. So right now you drive down the road, it's a little rough. It looks half done and it is half done. Um, there's one more layer, about an inch or two of asphalt that needs to go on the road. And then while you're driving there, you go, well, why does it look really kind of crummy and patched on the side of the road? And that and that's actually to protect the curb. It's like a one or two inch lip of curb there and protect that from the plow. So some guy in a truck just kind of shoveled asphalt out in front of that curb, curb and made it a little smoother so the, uh, the plow trucks didn't scrape up our brand new curb. So all that'll be scraped off next year. We'll put on our final layer of asphalt 
and then we'll put on a stripe so it'll look nice smooth surface so it won't be as, as bumpy it is today um also out there we're going to have bike lanes obviously so they're not striped there today um, so the road looks a lot wider than it actually will be in the end uh, we still have boulevard restoration and some uh, front yards to also restore so they're on our list we won't forget about you um utility upgrades so we did a lot of digging of big holes out there so what were we doing while we were out there um so we have a whole mile of water main to do on this project the whole length of the project's getting new water main and that's probably about a million dollars worth of work so it's not a, a small small item it's one of our major items to do out there and, and, and along with that there's about 12 lead water services that uh um that go to homes that we wanted to replace with non-lead water services. Uh, and we were able to do that with this project and it was really a good thing. Along with that, um, there's 30 sewer services. So the homeowners own the sewers from their house to the main. And while they're out there, they get the option to redo the sewer service while we're out there. So that's a very good thing that way they only pay for the sewer service and, and not the ripping up the road. We can take care of the road part. Uh, street lighting. Street lighting is very important for especially pedestrians at night and student safety at night. Uh, was Having a pedestrian level street lighting was very much a goal on this project. And storm sewer. So we wanted to upgrade the storm sewer system, add in some stormwater treatment areas, and that was also done with the project. Um, so sanitary sewer. So if you were a homeowner out there and asked for a sewer service, um, this is kind of what it looks like. So it goes from the house to the main and in the roadway. And right now they're 50, 60 years old and they're clay. So they tend to crush easily, fail easily. They get tree roots in there. Um, so at this point, um, the homeowner can have an option to replace the sewer service at all they have to pay for is the pipe. And then we take care of the rest, the sidewalk, the curb, the road, everything else. The only unfortunate part is if there's a tree like this example here over the sewer service, unfortunately the tree has to go in order to replace the sewer service. So that is uh, one downfall of that. So we're gonna talk a lot about trees tonight and, uh, and rightfully so, because what did we do to save trees and why did we eliminate trees? And we're gonna talk a lot about what's going on with the trees on this project. So how did uh, the county save trees on this project? So we eliminated parking. So about half the parking spaces on this project went away so we could preserve trees and, and keep them where they're at pretty much. Uh, shifting the roadway. So we can, since we're building a new one, we can move the road kind of east or west around the trees if we can. And I'll show you a slide later where we did that right in front of the mall area of the U. Uh, retaining walls. So if there's a steep slope, instead of grading out a long way for the the dirt, we can put up a retaining wall to kind of hold back the dirt and not and not grade out so far, impacting more trees. And old water main. So normally when you put a new water main, we take out the old water main. Uh, so don't nobody comes back in 50 years and goes, what's this pipe in the ground? Um, however, some of this water main was tangled up in the in the roots of the existing boulevard trees. So some of it we left in place. Uh, just to not injure the trees that were remaining. And the other thing is arborists. We met constantly with arborists out here trying to talk tree by tree. We went from one tree to the next tree and and say if we could tweak, you know, a bike path or move this or that, or will the tree make it if we just cut a few of the roots here? Um, there were many, many, many conversations with arborists out here and many, not just one, multiple arborists out here. So tree removal, uh, why did we remove trees? Uh, like I said before, sanitary sewer is one of them. Uh, parking bays is another. And and one thing we can do is we can combine things. So if let's say a homeowner wanted a sanitary sewer service done, that tree could be removed. Well, then that's more space available for potentially a parking bay that we don't have to remove another tree. Or if we're installing a hydrant, like the picture on the right there, um, we can, Put the hydrant where the sewer service was so then we can not eliminate a tree when we put a hydrant somewhere else so this is uh another way we can do this uh the multi-use trail uh if if we could not move the trail around the tree sometimes that impacted the trees uh if we had to widen for bike lanes and couldn't move the road uh, around the tree that sometimes impacted trees as well and also stormwater treatment 
So what's Cleveland look like now? What does it look like before we started? So it was a five foot walk on one side, uh, a nice boulevard, eight foot parking lane, uh, and then two lanes in each direction. And then on the U of M side was also a wider sidewalk. So what are we proposing to build? So uh, we'll put back a five foot walk. Normally we put back a wider six foot walk, but since we wanted to keep some of the trees there, we just kept it the same, same width uh, as to not impact the trees. And in some areas, there is a, a parking area or a parking bay uh, that's that's shown in this picture. If not, that parking bay is deleted and then the the boulevard is wider there. That eight foot turns into boulevard. Uh, and then we have bike lanes in each direction and traffic in each direction. And then an eight to 10 foot multi-use trail on the U of M side. So parking bays. So our number one comment during the design of this um, project was how can we preserve as much parking as possible out here? Uh, so we kind of hemmed and hawed on how to do this and and keep keep trees, keep parking, keep all the other goals we're having for um, for bike lanes and trail facilities and anything else we want out there. So what we came down with was uh, this parking bay option. So this this whole project's about a mile long, so about 10 blocks. So roughly we put in a parking bay every every other block. So there's about five of them out there. And what we want to do is right now the park cars hide the pedestrian. So if you're if you're um, walking out there and trying to cross the street and there's a park car there, it it covers you. The park car covers you so the, the drivers can't see the pedestrian coming out. So we wanted a, a large bump out, let's say, at each street. Um, so the park cars weren't hiding you. So to kind of bring the cars back and then in those large bump outs, we can put uh, more trees or anything else that we want there, wider boulevard and give a little more green space there. And then how else do we preserve trees? We put um, a new road curve in, in the roadway. So physically move the whole road towards the U of M. So this is between Buford and Carter, kind of the mall area of the U. Uh, the U of M already had a 10 foot uh, sidewalk there and it was kind of offset from the road. It was set pretty far back. So we had this opportunity to uh, kind of move the entire roadway. So keep the, the boulevard exactly where it is today and keep that space there and then allow the trees to go. And if some reason, let's say a sewer service or something has to go in there and the tree was removed, at least we can put another one there and have a 12 foot space for a tree which is a lot happier place for it to be than let's say a five foot um, boulevard or really narrow boulevard uh, if we didn't move the road. So this was one of our many options for, for helping save trees on this project. So another th question is gonna be tonight, uh, we'll definitely get these at the end is, so how did we go from all of our public meetings where we said it was roughly about 65 trees that had to go to about 165 trees that have to go. So where is the main change of that of that number? Um, so circle right here is kind of the, um, a woodsy forested area between Larpenter and Hoyt. So if you drive out there now, it, the road's pretty wide. Um, it looks like there's plenty of room if you narrow the road to put in, you know, pedestrian um, pedestrian facilities and bike facilities and the road. And for a long while, I thought the same thing. Um, so what we we did was we worked with the arborists to kind of get some maps on all of our trees. So the arborists are great. They have GPS locations on all their trees, the species type, uh, the health of the tree, the diameter of the tree. Um, they have all these great maps that they shared with us about where these trees are and what we talked about. And we went to many, many meetings with all of these maps and talked about where these trees are and how we can move things around to protect them. Unfortunately, these are volunteer trees, so they're just in the forest. They live, they grow, they die without anybody tracking them. So they were left off those um, GPS located sheets. Um, so somewhere during the, the pandemic, so everyone was kind of locked up at home and we were trying to finish up the design here. We're looking at this going, well, this isn't really wide enough. How are we going to fit this in here without hitting the trees? Um, so we come to the conclusion, well, these trees have to go who do we got to meet with to, to figure out what we do with these trees? So we leaned on our arborists. So we called up our arborists, went out there, and this was in the dead of winter. 
uh, in the middle of the pandemic before everyone's vaccinated. So we're all in our ski clothes, masks, PPE, six feet going out here looking at this stuff. And it's about zero degrees outside your masks all frosted up and, and trying to figure out what can we do with these trees and um, um, basically we came to the conclusion of we should build some walls so we don't impact the trees beyond these circles and one of the biggest regrets and I is not having a public meeting just on this area right here because we kind of met with the arborists and and moved on from there and it's uh I sincerely apologize for the the lack of communication on this area right here and I'm going to go to the next slide we'll talk about this some more so currently it is 45 feet in existing trees uh in existing area of south of Larpenter so it's fairly wide there's a lot of space for cars uh there's kind of a five foot paved area it's not really an area where you can walk real comfortably, definitely not somewhere you can bike or put a, a wheelchair on. So right now today, if you're on a wheelchair, you're in the street. Or if you're on a bike, you're in the street. So we knew at the end of this to get attain our goals, we needed to add some sort of bike and, and pedestrian facility. Um, so in the end, we have uh, a bike lane in each direction, a drive lane in each direction, a five foot walk, uh, on one side for anybody in a wheelchair and then a path on the other side. So that's about 58 feet. Um, so one thing that people look at this go, well, why do you need all this boulevard space? Well, we definitely need it this year for any snow removal. Uh, when you get narrow boulevard, snow removal gets real tough. And then you can see there's pedestrian level street lighting. So on the U of M campus and pretty much anywhere around the city, uh, we like the pedestrian level street lighting just for safety. So that these are things that we we want to have in there. So what have we been doing since since the spring? So the spring happened, we started construction and um, we've been trying to do more engagement, more more talking to the public, and we've been meeting quite a bit with the St. Anthony Park Community Council. Uh, kind of meeting one on one and then asking a lot of questions about trees and, and moving things here or there. So we've been meeting a lot with them. And then once we were done meeting with them, we were going to have a public meeting like this. However, um, we were constantly trying to make changes and trying to um, come to questions and come to meet with them. And at some point, I mean, we're still not done at all. We're just like, OK, time out. We got to have a public meeting to at least catch everyone up to know what's going on. And along with this, um, we're working with uh, the Friends of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee on that area we just talked about, uh, um, south of Larpenter there, on how to remove the trees without impacting any, let's say, uh, nest sites or overwintering bees or whatnot. And, and those conversations are ongoing. I think we can definitely uh, work together and still will continue to work together to get uh what we can do to to help out the the bees in that area so also speaking of bees is what else are we doing for native plants uh bee habitat uh butterfly habitat uh what else we can do on this project uh besides just you know uh plant grass i guess uh, on the south end of the project near como uh we are planting a, a large rain garden it has over 800 native plants so it's a pretty large space and here are some of the plants that we're planting uh purple coneflower uh metal blazing star uh, milkweed blue wild indigo baptista uh joe pie weed and wild bergamot and also called a minarda so i'm told the butterflies don't come with the plants but hopefully will just appear uh when we're done so um, with that, I will take questions, and if um, uh, County Commissioner Maris Castillo is on, I'll let her talk as well. But my uh, phone number is on here. If you need to contact me, my email address, uh, there's the project website where you can also leave comments, and there's also a in-person U of M meeting um, at the Student Center that'll be on this very subject on February 7th, 5 to 7. So the Student Center is just a few hundred feet down the street from uh, Buford and uh, Cleveland, if you want to go. Hey, Nick, can and, you, go ahead. Uh, can you say a couple of things about kind of the format of that meeting and um, and parking? Yes, uh, the U of M was nice enough to uh, provide their lot just north of there um, for free parking, and it will be kind of an open house style, so kind of come and go as you please, and me, Brian, 
bunch of my friends will uh, uh, be there to kind of open and ask questions. And we'll have a big layout so you can see every square foot of the project and where all the trees are and, and everything you want to know. Um, a little more hands on than this meeting. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. The commissioner is on her way. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly when she's going to show up. So there's a hand raised, Pat. Hold on, Pat. I'm, you should be unmuted. Hold on. Pat, if you click unmute, I th no, it's not working. I, would, I think we just enabled your mic, so I don't. Oh, hold on, let me. All right, now try it, Pat. All right, try it now, Pat. No. All right, try try it now. Okay, let's see. Nick, this is John Mazzatello from Ramsey County. Yeah. Maybe if you just have people put their questions in the chat, we can respond to them. Um, read the question off and then respond to them. Just a suggestion. Yeah, and it should be working. I don't know why it's not. Yeah, let me see what I can do. If you start answering the questions in the chat, let me see if I can tinker with it, okay? Nick, can you I got it. All I had to do was hit save. All right, try this now, Pat. I was just going to read the questions that there Catherine Marie had sent, but um, <laughs> there were a few in the chat if you wanted to deal with those first. No, sorry. I had to make sure you could talk before I got to the chat. Sorry, Pat. Okay. If you wanted to deal with the chat ones first, that's fine too. So. Do, do you want to deal with the chat questions first? Sure. Uh, I think Ava asked uh, an assessment invoice. Uh, the only thing you'd be assessed for is a sewer service, and that will probably come at the end of the project. So they're all complete. Um, other than that, you wouldn't be assessed for like the roadway or, or lighting or anything like that. And Nick, can you say project so completion? It... Right, to find that... if I was told it was going to come at the end of 2022. But you think it'll come a year from now? Did it? Did they do their your sewer service this year? Yes. Yeah, it might come at the end of twenty two, or they might wait until the end of the project. I'd have to ask the the sewer department. Okay, yes, I'll I will be following up with that because I just would like to know when it's going to come in. I think it's going to be you said somewhere between thirty four or thirty seven hundred, something like that. So I would like to know. Yep, yep. And follow me up. Ava, we talk on email all the time. Just send me an email. Yep. Thanks. I will. I will do we'll that. We'll figure Thank it you. out. Thanks. Yep. You know, Nick, some of my questions are the ones I'm going to read off are showing up in the chat. So maybe I should just go. <laughs> yeah. Um, because uh, you want yeah, you can just start, Pat. Are, are, okay, yeah, actually there were a number of questions related to some of the ones that are showing up, which are literally about the um the swing in the road at Buford and um, the way the parking spots uh, with the parking bay, they're just south of Buford. Um, I don't know if you've driven through there much now, especially since the snow has been building up, but um, 
as everybody sees with parking bays, uh, a lot of people tend to cheat the uh, parkers tend to cheat the end of the parking bay and the the, bo the butt of the last car sticks out into the driving or in this case, the bike lane. Um, and, this, and with the way that the road uh, swing there is, that's particularly noticeable. Um, and and I've gotten emails from folks and uh, there were several questions in the questions that SAPC collected and there's already a question there from someone in the chat uh, saying if there's going to be any changes at the Buford Cleveland, I guess that's about the intersection itself, but it's exacerbated because it's near the intersection. Um, so um, the questions that were in this specifically about that one was under safety and a couple were under road quality. Um, just it's very, it seems extra narrow and, and I don't know if there's still a chance to re look at, look at that. Uh, it's, People are going to be sticking out into that bike lane all the time from those part that parking spot specifically, maybe at both ends of it. <laughs> so anyway, so so right now I think people are parking in the bike lane. So oh for sure there is a that. parking bay, and people used to park the entire length of that roadway sure. because you could. I mean it was legal. Yeah. So people are remembering this, and right now the bike lane is not striped. So people are parking in the bike lane. Um, so I think this problem will go away once we stripe a bike lane in there because there'll be an obvious parking bay and then there'll be you'll be sitting on a bike symbol when you park um well, I, I think so we'll I, see but i think we all i think everywhere that there are parking bays like another parking bay in our neighborhood that we're most of us are familiar with is down by the speedy market which has a parking bay also um and people come and go from there a lot it's similar to the area by the u where there's a lot of parking turnover and uh mm -hmm. the cars that are at the end of it are always start sticking out into the street. Um, and I think that will be true here. And of course it will be into the, the bike lane instead of into the driving lane because there will be a bike lane. Um, so I'm just saying, I think you can watch for that and it will be happening. Yep. And we will call parking enforcement <laughs> at that time, but hopefully, I mean, it's the problem is we're in the middle of construction. So we're trying to, uh, you know, remodel our kitchen and make Thanksgiving dinner at the same time. So there's some things that aren't complete and aren't quite ready yet. And I think that's one of them that's um, that's really struggling with parkers out there is there isn't there a lot of stripes out there to tell you where you can and cannot be. So um, when you restripe the, uh, the 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 Buford intersection, you're going to have a stop line again like there used to be. And there's a comment about the having to back up for buses turning. Um, there used to be a stop line, which not everybody obeyed, of course, which helps with the buses. <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry. So, so we'll have a stop line, and I think there's a sign there now that says, you know, stop yeah. here. People don't see the little, sign. The yeah, people don't better. see the sign, but I, we put that back just in case, you know, it's a snowy day and you can't see the line. So there's a sign and stripes that will come back in. Yeah. So uh, I, maybe just deal with, if you want to go deal with the chat questions, I'll. Go. So I think that there's a thread here, Pat, that um, there's one person who's saying there's a design problem. I think we want to explore what that. Yeah, can, that's what I'm trying uh, to touch on that. that there's there's a design. There were also questions about the actual intersection. And I think that's part of what um, was talked about to the act, you know, because of the crooked intersection. Um, there's two different things. There's the parking bay question. And uh, I'm not sure is it Bob that's talking about this, but the intersection itself uh, because of the crooked intersection, there's sort of two different concerns around Buford and you're very aware of the crooked intersection, I know. Um, so, and the bus is turning out and, you know. So Nick, do we, do we presume that the design issue gets solved once we complete the work? Is that what we're saying? So I would, also bring that comment when we're standing in front of the the layout next in two weeks from now it would be nice to kind of hash this out a little more if people see things that that i'm not seeing and i mean it's obviously not built yet so we can still tweak a, a sign or striping if we need to um but we did spend a very large amount of time on that intersection because it is offset extremely unusual and buses use it so I think step one was to get rid of the parking near there. That really helped. And then um, step two is you have a bike lane there that adds a little extra width for a turning vehicle. Um, so you don't have to make a tighter radius. So if um, if we want to get around a round table at, at the public meeting in two weeks, I think that would be greatly helpful. 
And there was a question in the chat. Have the plants already been installed in the rain garden? I don't I don't believe so. We were in the middle of a drought last year, so it wasn't uh, a good time to plant plants. So I don't think they're in yet. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they weren't. Yeah. Um, OK, so some of the other questions. Um, so have you so there were a couple of questions related to this general idea um, and you've touched on the community engagement things that did or didn't happen during the um, you know this whole process in the last year um, but what will change in your community engagement practice in the future is a question that was asked through the questions that came in through to SAPSI. So the pandemic kind of changed everything uh, and obviously this one was started years before the pandemic so it wasn't really uh, um, set up for for how the pandemic was supposed to work. Um, we do a lot more online comment mapping. We can do a socially distanced pop-up event now. Like we learned a lot of things in the last two years uh, that we didn't know when all of this started. So it was kind of a crazy time to go through final design on a project and not be able to meet with anybody. And that was a, a struggle on my end, a struggle on your end. It was a struggle with everybody. And it just, the, the communication really broke down on this one and it was, um a, a terrible time kind of for everybody on on all that and and that's definitely on us and that was and for that i apologize and we are unfortunately prepared for the next pandemic or any social distance event we'll ever need um so we'll have this figured out for the next one but this one got uh we really fumbled the ball on this one for sure um, do you want to jump to the back to the chat and then just answer the sure. question about when the sidewalks on the east side or the west, sorry, the west side will be completed and it'll be in the spring. Do you have a general yep. idea of when? So it'll start whenever obviously it stops snowing, which is hopefully sometime soon. Um, <laughs> um, it, it generally has to be above freezing when we do sidewalks. And it'll be one of the first things we do because um, we've got to restore the boulevards and restore people's front yards and and that sidewalk elevation kind of sets the tone for everything. So basically it's the first thing, one of the first things we'll do is put the sidewalk in and then we want to put the last layer of asphalt after that. Um, so we don't mar up the asphalt with concrete chucks and the concrete and all that stuff. So that'll be one of the first things we do. So Nick, can you speak a little to the sequencing? I think that there's a question here that relates to like, are we going to see the sidewalks in phase one get completed before we start other work or? Yep, so there'll be kind of some things done in parallel because there's quite a bit of work still to do on phase one, but we don't want to stop phase two. So um, so the first thing we'll do is we're working with um, uh, the friends of the Rusty Patch will be to figure out how to remove trees and when to remove trees to kind of uh, preserve bee habitat as much as possible. So we'd like to do that in the winter while everything is hibernating. And um, we might have to come back and get the stumps uh, some other time in the later spring area, but that but that's just fine. Um, so one of the first things we'll do is sometime this winter here, hopefully fairly soon, uh, while there's a lot of snow on the ground protecting things, is is do the tree removal, and then when spring stop starts, whenever it stops snowing, we'll we'll start working on pretty much everything else. So uh, we'll close the road between Buford and. and and Larpenter and start with the sewer crews while we probably can do lane closures and whatnot um, for let's say concreting sidewalks or boulevard grading and, and that kind of thing. We'll have to flag people around. So at some point we might have to close the whole thing just to do the final lift of paving um, to get that out of the way. But we can we can work with our contractor on scheduling that. And then the lights um on the east side go up there in but not on is that right is that i'm gathering from what ava said in the chat yeah and i don't know if luke luke our construction engineer is on that does he know anything about the wiring of that you can put something in the chat or comment i'm not sure offhand nick i can look into that and see it it might be a feed issue uh, some of those might have been fed from a different cabinet so I, i'd have to look to know for sure on what's being fed from where there i know they're waiting on Excel for a little while on some things out there, but I haven't heard specifically on the street lights, so I can I can look into that and see. Okay. Um, a couple more on original questions that were sent in. Um, there's a question or kind of a long comment more that was very much directed to sort of the disappointment about the lack of engagement and the the you know 60 trees to 160 trees, and it it's. I think you really addressed it. I mean, I guess I hope this person feels that what you said earlier, Nick, addressed it um, pretty directly, what they're saying about being disappointed in the lack of 
uh, communication and engagement after the original uh, statement was made about how many trees. I feel like you covered what they're disappointed about. I hope they feel that you covered exactly what they said. I don't know that I want to read the entire statement, um, but I think you did cover it. So I'm not going to read it. I hope that's okay. Um, some other things that came in in the other category are what will the 87 bus detour be during the construction? And where did that detour last year? I assumed it, it was went Raymond. On Raymond. Yeah. And so it, I it was around where it started from, depending on what was going on. But it was because Buford was open. Yes. Now it so probably won't be. That's now it probably question. won't be. Um, so. And there's also buses on Buford that will probably go down to Commonwealth, I'm assuming. And now the current buses that are on Cleveland will go there's through. No, well, oh, well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, they detour through the campus is what I'm saying. If they went from the campus and need to go continue on to wherever they're going. So. So they'll just so they'll come out onto uh, this onto phase the phase one section, basically. Correct. Kind of, and Correct. Okay, somehow. Yeah. OK. OK, and then stay on Cleveland, basically. OK, um, will the Buford intersection be closed through the whole construction project or only part of it? Like they'll get it, it done, the, reopen As far it. as I know, the whole uh, as the whole season wide. Okay. Um, however, we will work with the U if for some reason there's a bus that can't get through on Commonwealth or something like that. We might end up opening partial of it. Because there are but some as of right now it'll be closed on, on the campus there's some one-way streets that might they might make them i don't know what the u is going to do who knows right yeah yeah so we'll have to work with the u to, on how their inner inner workings go if that if that road gets closed okay okay so this person asks at an in-person open house during the com community engagement project you know process several years ago they, this person asked one of the officials from Ramsey County if they would consider improving the southeast corner at Cleveland and Larpender. So basically, I mean the Larpender sidewalk uh, at Cleveland. There is a short section on Larpender that's narrow with obstructions and never gets plowed in the winter. This is also where there is a bus temporary parking spot on Larpender. This person who wrote this was assured that this was being studied at the time, along with other improvements at that intersection, and they are wondering what the status is now or in the, the in the plan. So we are entering that intersection. So whenever we do any work, we have to do it ADA compliant. So you have to be able to get a wheelchair through, and I don't think you can oh, for presently. God. So what we're doing is we're widening the sidewalk. So we're going to make it wide enough to Someone can plow it because I'm sure the U would plow it if they could get a vehicle on it. Um, and wide enough for a wheelchair or someone to plow it in the future. So that is definitely on our to-do list next year. Okay. And that is where there's a bus, for everybody else's information, that's where the 61 bus stops across yep. from Bell Museum going east. Correct. Um, the road, uh, now we're into road quality. And this relates a lot to the, the what you just, you touched on about the road on the phase one, um, the, new, the new road. Uh, Let's see, um, I think you probably covered this um, about the uneven paving quality. Um, let's see, and then people asking about the not enough room to, to pass or, you know, feeling like it's too narrow just south of Buford because of the parked cars sticking out into the, what we talked touched about. Um, and then the uneven pavement there again, parked cars sticking out at Buford. There were multiple comments about that, Nick. I am not kidding. There were a lot of comments. So I think I'll work with my construction folks. I think we need way more no parking. I think we have one. We probably need like many more. Um, so I'll work with our construction folks to put up some more no parking signs because I think they're parking in in the bike lane correct currently because they think it's a parking lane. What well, they're in the parking bay, but they're mm -hmm. halfway in it anyway. Yeah. So they're sticking out of it. They're not out of the parking bay completely. Yeah. So, even the angle park, you shouldn't be parking could, in. No. Anybody hey, else speaking? Sorry. Hey, hey, Pat, this is Luke with Ramsey County, the construction engineer. They're not parking in the taper of the parking bay, are they? They're just parked oh, yeah. out in the street. They're, They're in the tapers the on either the end, ones too. I've seen, Luke. I don't know everybody all okay. the time, but the ones I yeah. see. That was what I was kind of thinking in my head. I was like, I bet they're parking in those tapers of the parking yeah. bays. We're probably going to have to yeah. do something about that. We can look into trying something. I mean, people there. tend to do that in general with parking bays. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But. Um, then this is about the more about the intersection, which people also commented on here in the chat. Uh, the intersection at Buford, it says in Doswell, but they mean Cleveland, is unsafe. 
People don't know whether they can turn, turn right on red, go through to Buford from the university area after turning at, oh, from the, when they're coming from the, the campus, I see. It needs better signs. Please make sure the bike lane goes through clearly marked with good visibility. And then also they, they separately said, the crossing near the St. Paul gym is also dangerous. Please make sure the crossing is clearly marked. I know this, you're intending to have a crosswalk on one side of the, the Dudley intersection, not the other side. Um, in general, I know I personally have said, why are we not having a crosswalk on both sides of the Dudley intersection and the Commonwealth intersection? This is a conversation we've already had, but um, so anyway. Yeah, so crosswalks, pretty much every intersection out here deserves a crosswalk, right? And there's paint issues and, and maintenance issues and the expectation of the driver. So we wanna put crosswalks where you're going to see people crossing. And um, years ago, traffic engineers, uh, anybody who wanted a stop sign, got a stop sign. So there's stop signs everywhere you go now and people kind of roll through them. So we don't want that to be the case with, with crosswalks. We wanna put them in locations where people are gonna actually cross um, and we don't want a hundred of them in a mile because then people don't listen to them. So we want them where people will cross and hopefully people will listen and, and cross in the crosswalk and um, kind of help us out with giving the drivers the expectation of if there's a crosswalk there, they're going to expect to see people in the crosswalk. Does that make sense, Pat? I mean, you know, these are all things that people debate, right? We know this. I don't want to get all carried away about, you know, no. the conversations that happen between people on these things. Um, uh, but, you know, anyway. So uh, there's a couple other, I, I have some more questions still coming from the original questions. Um, we have a few more things coming in about, um, back to our, our, our thing about the narrow spot. Um, um, Molly asks, uh, you know, in the chat there that you keep saying Nick, next year, does that mean uh, this coming construction season? I assume it does. Yep. Next construction season. Sorry, yeah. the year has changed 24 yeah, days ago. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. That's a good so the thing. next construction season is what I meant. Yeah, um, and then uh, just back to our our narrow spot again. When you're looking at that, um, uh, Bob, Bob is you know saying it's still very tight. He doesn't think there's room for a bike lane as it is. And I I just said I just put in the chat, Bob. There really is room. <laughs> like a, a driving lane is 11 feet wide. Your car is six feet wide, man. And then the bike lane is another six feet. I mean, there's and the, and then there's another two like what a foot I guess it is of, of concrete for the curb and gutter, so like there's a lot of space there. We all feel like our cars are wider than they are, and I mean the bus is wider obviously. But sorry, let Nick say it. He's the engineer. But <laughs> so um, so yeah, that's the reason why our streets 11 feet wide because a bus with mirrors is 10 and a half feet wide. So so the U of M buses don't clip their mirrors off. We make the roads 11 feet wide. If it was just for cars, they'd all be eight feet wide. So. It depends on where you are. <laughs> <laughs> right, but the bike lane is another six. Yeah, yep. So, so there's really a lot of room. I know the snow gets in there. That's another thing, right? But Well, and everything yeah. feels tight this time of year, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every street I drive on is six feet narrower than it was right. two months ago. Right. For sure. Um, this has but, been but a crazy year. Those cars sticking out that are in the end of the bike, uh, the parking bay definitely are in making it even narrower. For that's sure. true, yes. Yep, yep. That's our uh, three thousand pound traffic calming right there. But unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. when it affects a bus turning, then it becomes more of a an emergency. Let's say. But Bob, Bob, Bob Craven and I have emailed each other. Like he knows that I say like all these things are actually just traffic calming, Bob. That's what I actually tell them, right, Bob? So. Um, so so back to the chat here. Um, yeah. someone asked about the decision made on the the species of the seventy boulevard trees that are planted. Mm. Oh, right. Uh, diverse mix. Um. So we do work with uh, the arborists on what mix to use. And then we also consulted the community council um, to see if they have a favorite species out of the, the kind of a list that the, the arborists like to use. So, uh, so yes, we have a diverse mix. They're trying not to put two trees similar together. Uh, we don't want to end up with the emerald ash borer again, so. Right. Um, so Gary, Gary said the point about sort of addressed what you were saying, Nick, about the crosswalks, that the expectation is the, cro the pedestrian would cross over to the crosswalk, but it doesn't happen, especially at Commonwealth, which is really true. Um, I have a friend who was almost killed at Commonwealth, a, doc a person who was the doctor at the St. Paul campus for years, who's now retired, but um, 
you know, 10, 20 years ago, she was almost killed there. But um, she she thinks she was almost killed, whatever. Um, you know, but the pedestrian doesn't have to cross over. That just because there's not a painted crosswalk, you can still cross at the intersection. Every intersection is a crosswalk. Um, Correct. So, um, you know, there's no reason that the person has to cross to the go to the crosswalk. Um, so anyway, just so everybody so knows. But another thing that's happening, you know, previous to this project is there were just parked cars everywhere hiding all the pedestrians. So if you walked out into the street, no one saw you before you took true. your first step. It'll be more visible for sure. And and yeah. one thing nice about the bike lanes is your first two steps is in a bike lane. So you're right. in the street physically somewhat protected before you actually get in to the roadway. So the, the car can't say, well, I didn't see it. Well, you were on a bump out and you're two steps into the street and you're finally into the drive lane. So you really had to be staring at your phone not to see this person in the street, so. Mm -hmm. so, Betty, so Betty Wheeler's asking about, you're talking about phase two area, I assume Betty, the part that's not been fixed uh, yet. Um, so the terrible potholes north of Buford, basically. Um, yeah. Um, the ones that won't stay in, like this, it would have to be, you know, winter cold fill kind of, um, you know, it's all tra it's all traffic coming, Betty. Come on, just drive slower. But yeah, um, Ava asked the question in the chat about um, why the U of M buses can't create a loop inside their property and eliminate the turn on Cleveland. And I guess I don't know. I'd have to ask the U of M people about that. I think that's been that asked is, before. I remember that, that being a good asked question, at some though. point during the engagement process, too. <sighs> I'm sure they have reasons. You know, that's for John. I don't know if John Mark Lucas is the person that deals with that now or not. Um, um, I'll I'll ask my contacts at the U, which thankfully in this project, I have a great many now. Uh -oh. So Mar Margaret just asked what the speed limit will be on Cleveland. I don't know if Ethan can talk to that, but I, I yep. have an answer for that. But maybe Ethan would like to answer it. So currently, by statute, it's as low as it can go, 30 miles an hour. However, we all know that's a law and statutes can change. So one thing uh, about putting a bike lane on here is if ever the law changed that county roads with bike lanes on it could be lower than that, then the speed limit could be lowered with a change in the law. Um, so that is one benefit to having a bike lane out there. Right. Um, are there any notes in the chat that hadn't been answered? Because I think I have a few more from the other questions. So let's see. Oh, so let's see. Um, this was written. In, Will you pay more attention to detoured traffic this year? <laughs> but that sort of ties into the, just the general question about the detour in gen, detour. Where, where will the I mean, I know the official detour will be to not come this way at all and to go around the way it was last year. But as the local traffic detour is more what we mean, because um, yeah. it's and a little different because you can't get through it Dudley, uh, you know, and Buford will be closed. It probably won't be as bad. <laughs> I, would, um, I would hope so, because I mean, there's a lot more traffic coming off Larpeter than Como, probably. Um, it's not so much bad, it's just that you can't get through. Yeah, and you, you know, can't get north. Could. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's you're going to a dead end. Um, also, St. Paul Regional Water helped us out by digging up a lot of, you know, side streets last year with traffic calming um, um, measures, although I don't think that was their intent. Um, so I, I'm hoping it'll be better this year, like you said, because the street won't go through. Um, Ramsey, you want to you want to say something? I, uh, Nick, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Oh, you just said St. Paul Regional Water, and I just wanted to kind of throw my hand up to more or less say that I'm present here for any questions regarding uh, some of that water main work you were describing. Uh, but yeah, just we just kind of wanted to. I raised the the hand there just to let you know that yeah, we're we're here in the meeting for any questions regarding uh, the water utility, any lead replacements, or any questions regarding. Uh, improvements to that water infrastructure. That's good to know, Ramsey. Thank, thanks for being here tonight. Um, so one last thing sort of related to some under safety as far as the categories that um, the SAPSI questions came in, and it is still related to kind of people crossing the street, again, pedestrian sort of infrastructure. Um, someone asked, will there be any flashing light 
and then they said pedestrian crossings, which you know we've already talked about crosswalks um, along the street. Um, a lot of students, staff, faculty, uh, state fair visitors crossing. Um, it is seldom that standing on a curb or even stepping into the street will result in a driver obeying the law and stopping to allow a person to cross. And again, you just talked about that people will be more visible because of cars not being parked as close and having the um, bike lane even as a place that you can be seen. Um, so that's, I think that it, I, I hope I think it will be a better pedestrian environment, but it will also, I've already, we said this back in the back during the public engagement, be both a, a nice, smooth, faster surface and a perceived, in my opinion, wider street because of the bike lane only being a unprotected striped thing. So I know I already asked you this and you said you'll do it. We do want a speed study done after it's all done so we can sort of see how it is because we know what the speed was before the construction project. And so I want to get this documented. So yep. just and we the can, community knows we, we've already asked for that. And we can do a speed study after this. That's no problem. And what you are what you want to do is put friction in the street. So, I mean, not many people like park cars unless it's your house, then you love park cars. They, they absolutely calm traffic. It's no, it's somebody who can't parallel park or they're sticking out on the end of your parking bay. They calm traffic whether you like it or not. And then the same with bike lanes in the street. Um, so there's a person biking in the street. Nine out of 10 people don't want to zoom past them at 45 miles an hour because that could be your neighbor and that's not very nearly. Somebody don't, some people don't care. I'll go 45 by them, no problem. But it's 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 friction in the street that, that slows people down. So, um, Betty Wheeler asked in the chat, uh, Public Works fills potholes. Uh, as you can tell, they've been very busy um, plowing snow the last few weeks. So when they plow snow, they don't patch potholes. And I see a very long stretch of no snow and cold weather. So I will send them a note after this to put this on their pothole patching list. So um, thank you for the, the message. We'll see if it lasts until the construction starts. <laughs> it, it won't. They'll have every time they plow, they pretty much tear them out again. So they gotta come back week after week after week. So if mm. it's best if it gets cold and stays cold, and then they tend to last longer. Actually, mm. do you think the PowerPoint will be available online or just the recording? Um, we can do PowerPoint gets pretty big. We'll probably do the recording. I'll ask if we could do the whole PowerPoint because it's kind of a large file with mm. all the pictures in it. Um, will the street be reopened during the fair this year? Uh, that's a good question. We try and get it open for the fair. However, we kind of started late last year yeah. and didn't get close enough, so we kept it closed. So I would say probably that qualifies for this year as well. If we get far enough along that we can pave the street, we will probably open it. If not, not. Um, Luke Lordy can correct me if I'm wrong. You, your intent would be to, but it depends on how it goes. Yes, it depends on how it goes. Okay. Our 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 hope, Pat, would be that if we can, you know, if we get started right away here this spring, the Aprilish time frame, May time frame, that we would at least have a base course down out there and we could put put traffic on it for, during the fair. That that's our our goal. Okay. All right, we're onto the trees for the questions about trees. Um, what is the source of the trees and any other plants that you're going to? The actual meaning, like the nursery source, not like what kinds are they um, that of the trees and any other plants that you plant because most of the stock plants sold by large growers have been pre treated with systemic pesticides such as neonics and hopefully you know what that means which are chemicals that uh, transport through the entire plant including the flowers the source of the pollen and nectar needed by pollinators things that will poison any insect that accesses it and kills any insect, including beneficial insects and honeybees and rusty patch bumblebees. The ubiquitous use of systemic pesticides in both rural and urban environments is a major factor in the serious declines we are experiencing in pollinator and other beneficial insect pollinators um, uh, populations. So do you know the source of the trees and if they are ones that flower and then any other, you know, the ones in the plants in the rain gardens, obviously. Um, Maybe flowering shrubs that might get planted. Um, Brian, that, you want to take this one? Yeah, so Pat, we've been in conversation. I, I imagine that comment might have come from the people that we've been talking to about that issue. And we're trying to get to a place where we have a good source that doesn't provide us with that kind of plant life. Um, 
So I, I'd say it's in discussion right now. Okay. Yeah. Because it's even hard to know that yeah, even from right. those growers. They don't know where their stuff comes. I, I work yeah. on a plant sale and I, I know it's really hard to know the answer to that question. So I just sure. want to say I, I appreciate how hard it is to even know the answer to that question. Well, so, and, and we appreciate community members like yourself who are willing to try to do some due diligence for us and, and help us get to sources that you are aware of in your work. That um, Shrubs are, trees are really hard. Yeah. They find yep. things that haven't been treated. Uh, so anyway, um, I, I wanted to also point out there have been several people, uh, you know, saying thanks for the good choices of the plants, the types of plants in the rain garden. Like that's that's, you know, and I actually I should say I was I gave some feedback on those plants like two years ago. So anyway, y'all. But anyway, that wasn't my yeah, idea. So they weren't my idea. Community <laughs> Council greatly helped us with our Not selection of rain garden plants. So. Stephen yeah. more. so thank you to Pat and her crew. Yeah, it wasn't it was more Stephen. And then um, so we've got, as you said, you've been uh, talking with the, the friends of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee folks. And so now we've got a Rusty Patch question in here. Um, and it was just pointing out, just as it's more for information of everybody else in the group here more than uh, the folks from Ramsey County, because they've been hearing about this a lot. Um, so um, again, this was turned into the SAPC questions. Did you know that the endangered Rusty Patch Bumblebee was chosen as the Minnesota State Bee? And that the U of M campus um, has been uh, has been officially designated as the U of M Twin Cities B campus, and that the Rusty Patch has been documented in a few places on the St. Paul campus within the flight range of this uh, particular group of trees that Nick had circled in that red with that red circle there along the edge of Cleveland, and that is slated for destruction. In addition, this area on Cleveland has been mapped by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as within the red zone for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee as a um, highest potential habitat for this endangered bee. Of particular concern for those trees um, that the, the friends of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee have been talking to the county about um, is that they are within the foraging, overwintering, and nesting habitat of the federally listed endangered Rusty Patch Bumblebee. So how will the bees be protected during the reconstruction phase and how will their habitat be protected? That's so cool. that's where we've been working with the bee experts. Uh, thankfully, we have an entomologist on this project. I, I never had to work with one before, but uh, I'm, I'm thankful that they're on the project and teaching me all the things I need to know. Uh, we can remove, we could try and remove the trees without you know, disturbing the ground because um, we want to get the trees out of there before they flower and get birds nesting in them and, and insects in them and whatnot. Uh, so try and remove them without kind of like with a crane or an arm or something, remove them now-ish and let the uh, overwintering bees kind of be whatever they're doing. And then once they um, get out of their overwintering burrow, we can go in there and, and um, maybe cover it up with soil or something like that so they don't come back and, and, and build a nest permanently. Um, so we're working with them to figure out what dates that works well for them and and how to preserve the habitat as much as possible um, to do whatever we can do to help the bees. We're, we're willing to do it. There's actually only one. Well, there's only one thing left on here, and that's it's it's a it's a, it is I guess it's mostly a comment, but it does end in a question, and it's. Um, given that the city of St. Paul, and again, this is the county's project, not the city's, but given that the city of St. Paul has committed to maintaining and expanding tree coverage because of the numerous benefits trees provide to communities, our communities, how can the project manager justify removing 90 trees beyond the number that was originally, you know, discussed? Um, many of them mature. Here is a, um, and the Met Council made a statement back uh, about a year ago that trees play a vital role in combating climate change. Um, some of the models of climate change impacts in the Twin Cities show that we could have as many as 40 additional days above 90 degrees each year by 2050. Tree inequity creates hotter neighborhoods and an increase in premature deaths due to heat impacts. And while planting more trees is important, conserving mature trees offers the largest benefits. And then it quotes Ellen Esch, uh, who is a data scientist with the Met Council. She said, large trees provide more shade store more carbon and produce bigger benefits in terms of air and water quality. And then the person asking the question said, with all that being true, it seems extremely unwise to remove mature trees without lots of forethought and unless absolutely necessary, how can it be viewed? Otherwise, I would like to hear a good argument for the tree removal, not one based on making the project easier. 
that was the last question you got. Yeah, and avoiding trees on this project did not, you know, make the project easier. So we we did everything we could to to avoid as many trees as possible, and um, and still, you know, get the goal of getting a student to class as easily as better than today. So. And I won't rehash all those reasons as we went through the, the PowerPoint there. Um, I see no new questions in the chat. If anybody else wants to speak up or put in a question in the chat, um, now is your time. Can, can, you know, can I ask one question? It's not really about this project or this part of Cleveland, but somewhere in some somewhere along the way, I I saw uh, some mention of something possibly being done with Cleveland north of Larpender in terms of bike connection. Is that something that's on the table? So it would make more sense that this your this concern about in street lanes being done if that was on the table. So right now there's a shoulder up there and I'm not quite sure why there isn't a bike symbol painted on there. I mean, we could probably go out there and paint it today. Oh, normally we do that kind of thing with a resurfacing project. Um, there will absolutely in the future, I can't tell you what date, but there will be bike lanes on Cleveland North of here. Okay. So any other questions? Otherwise, uh, um, we can have uh, we can meet next time in about two weeks, February seventh, um, to meet at the student center, and we can meet in person, and we'll have big layouts drawn out, and we can look and point at specific areas and whatnot. So, thank you. Nick can Brian and I have a few closing comments if we so choose. Sure, they can go ahead. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm John Mazzatello. I'm the Deputy Director of Public Works in the Program Delivery Division. So projects like Cleveland that take place all over the county fall under my responsibility um, from design all the way through construction. There were some questions about public engagement and our process, and Nick, Nick did a good job of describing what we've learned from this process and having to navigate a project through a virtual world in a pandemic environment. But you know, the, the old adage is the buck has to stop somewhere and it stops with me because I'm in charge of program delivery. So we're going through internally with our staff, process reviews and lessons learned and establishing more of a concrete process for public engagement for our projects. That's going to include making sure that we're reaching out and publishing information to the public at key milestones during a project. So things like changes to landscape impact as we move through a design are clearly communicated to stakeholders in the community. So I'm not going to ask everybody to take my word for it. We have to prove it and earn it on future projects, but we are working internally to improve that process. Yeah. Well said, John. I think, I think we are working to, to come through the process. Um, so folks, I, I really appreciate the time. I appreciate the energy. Um, if you have other comments or you didn't feel like you had the time or space to throw your comments in to us, um, certainly you can get us comments before the next meeting. Um, and then we'll be prepared to be have a more uh, more robust conversation in person. Um, and again, appreciate your time and energy, and um, we'll see you in what two weeks from tomorrow, or a week from tomorrow, or oh, two weeks from tomorrow. Thanks a lot for the presentation and answering the questions. Thank you, folks. Have a good night.
And Nick, thank you for your continued accessibility throughout the project. You've been very good. You're very responsive to emails when I've sent photos of things asking, what is this <laughs> when something appears on, on my lawn <laughs> and I don't know what it is. <laughs> so I appreciate all that you have done. And I can only imagine what it's like working with a large group and trying to answer all the questions and everyone has a different idea. And in our political climate, I'm glad we're not acting like that in our small community <laughs> project piece here. So um, kudos to you and everyone. Thank you. Yep. It Thank you, Ava. You only ask good questions, so keep asking them. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing as a dumb question. They're all good questions. <laughs> Thank so. you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, folks. everybody. Right. Have a good night. Good night.